So hello everyone. My name is Hope Newport. I am the Family Services Manager at the IFOPA and you are at the FOP and Sexuality Part 1. Um, this is a webinar, as you can see. So um, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that um, this is going to be a two-part series. So um, we wanted to do a webinar to really just give an opportunity for people to get sort of an introduction to the topic, but we are planning a part two, which will be more interactive um, and be taking place later this fall. Um, I also wanted to say um, a special thanks to BioChrist, who is our 2023 IFOPA Family Services Programming Supporter, um, who without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring all this wonderful programming and these amazing speakers to the FOP community. So, and then I also wanted to um, start our time off today by um, kind of taking a moment to reflect and share our appreciation for a, a member of the FOP community who not only was very involved in supporting um, individuals and families in their journeys with FOP, but was an incredible champion for accessible sexuality. So Nick Mahler um, passed away sadly earlier this year, and I was really looking forward to working with him on this series. I know he would have been super involved and a great voice to contribute to this conversation. Um, so we were so sad when he passed away in March of this year, but we wanted to make sure to recognize him today um, for what he started, which he um, not only did he, you know, sort of mentor individuals, but he also founded Dallas Novelty, which is a um, sex toy retail business um, that is really focused on accessibility for everyone. So that was established in 2023. And when Nick passed away, um, his wife, Lori, who you can see here on the left, and his sister, Amanda, um, took Dallas Novelty on as their own, and they still um, are running and operating it. So it is a great resource. I'm happy to help connect people to um, Lori or Amanda if you have questions or um, to the website if you would like to um, access that. So um, it gives me great pleasure today to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Michelle Finan is a licensed mental health um, counselor and also has a PhD in clinical sexology. She's a board certified clinical sexologist with a master's in um, counseling with dual special specialization. Um, she is also um, a member of the osteogenesis imperfecta um, rare bone disease community and serves on their board of directors. So, um, you know, I met Michelle through a member of the Osteogenesis Imperfecta um, Society or group, and she has just been such an incredible resource, not only to me um, as I've continued to learn and find resources for our community, but I know that she is going to um, be a great resource to all of you. So Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. I've enjoyed working with you and I can't wait to share um, what you've brought together for the community for the community with them. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I said I was going to do this too. This slide for me is all about thanking you, Hope, for the opportunity to really sit and talk about what I believe is one of the more important topics that is overlooked when it comes to um, just living with a disability in general. And so I just appreciate so much anytime I'm given the opportunity to, to talk about a topic that is very important um, to all of us. So I appreciate that. And um, I, again, just really think that this is an important topic as someone who's in this community myself. And so we'll get to uh, talk about that a little bit more as well. I'll, I got my slide here, but you did a fantastic job of introducing me. Um, so as Hope mentioned, I am a clinical sexologist and I've been a mental health counselor for a little over a decade now. I specialize in working with people who have chronic illness and physical disability either um, in individual relationship coaching for singles or in couples where disability is present, either um, 
as someone who is growing up with that lived experience or when someone experiences an acquired disability and just how to navigate that in terms of relationships and intimacy and sex. Um, my experience in the rare disease world is from having osteogenesis imperfecta myself. I have a mild form of the disease, so that's called type one. And I was the first one in my family to have this disease until my husband and I um, had our two children who they both also have osteogenesis imperfecta. And so I share that to say that I'm wearing a few hats today as I'm doing this talk. So I'll be sharing as someone with a rare disease, as a caregiver to some to two little ones with a rare disease, and then also as a clinician too. So with that said, um, as a clinician, I'll be sharing my research, my main focus in, in research throughout my time in um, school was all on sex and disability, the art of creative positioning. And so I'm really looking forward to talking more about that um, in part two of the discussion. But right now we're really going to be laying that foundation of just even getting familiar with talking about sex and disability. Um, and with that said, it's not going to be from a space of medical advice. Anything I share today is something for you to take as um, just how to consider that for your own life and something to talk about with your medical team. It's not a substitution for working with a therapist, you know, all of these things that I just want to make sure that um, we're all taking care of our own health by working with our specialists and having that team, that multidisciplinary team. And if you don't have someone to talk about, then maybe this is an avenue to talk about relationships or mental health in general. Maybe this talk is kind of shining a light on the fact that you're wanting more support in that arena. So I hope that this might open some doors for you as well. Um, and so with that, we'll look at our objectives. So I've done my best to dive into the information about FOP online through the website. I have a um, fairly decent understanding of it, but um, as I was telling Hope when we were chatting, it's almost like what I imagine people experience when they don't know someone with Oh, I like myself where it looks one way on paper, but the lived experience may be a bit different. So I'm so excited to be talking to all of you today so that I can really enhance my understanding of how sex and FOP go hand in hand. Um, so we are taking what I've learned about FOP and we're looking at topics of sex intimacy and relationships through the lens of disability. We are, I think, most importantly, establishing a safe place to really even have this conversation. I think that from just what I know in my own experience and in working with other people with disabilities, sex is not often talked about. So we want to make a safe space regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, whatever it is, and have this be an, a place to go to and um, talk about this topic. Um, I also wanna affirm that there are challenges that are unique to the experience of living with a disability and having intimacy with you know, even having a sexual experience by ourselves, let alone with other people, there are challenges involved. So we want to affirm that and talk about those things. We don't want to ignore them and pretend they're not happening. And we also really want to identify opportunities to see where there are things that can be done that maybe we didn't even have on our radar. So opportunities to express sexuality regardless of our physical limitations. 
In addition to our objectives, I always like to start with the why, and we'll talk about the what and the how that comes from that. But really, our why is this, you know, knowledge that addressing sexual health will lead to an improved quality of life. It it just does. When we're looking at people as a a whole being from a holistic standpoint, um, and just identifying the fact that you are a sexual being, regardless of whether or not you have a disability, um, that's going to improve your overall quality of life. And so then what do we want to do? We want to increase our level of comfort with talking about sexual health. If you have FOP, if you are a caregiver to someone who has FOP, and I'll also be making sure that you have a good understanding of how you can be supportive of someone, um, maybe if you are a family member supporting their um, sexual health concerns. And I want to talk about what those con concerns are, because again, I can identify what generally those concerns are for people when they have physical disabilities, but there may be unique concerns specific to the FOP community that I would love to learn about today and have open dialogue about. Um, so I encourage you all to submit questions and answers. As Hope was saying, we will do those anonymously, um, keeping in mind that this is a recorded um, webinar. And so we don't want to share too much detail. So we would always just stick to the headline, make it um, general of what you're looking for so that I can help answer that question. So headlines and not details. And then we've got that part two coming to where maybe we can get a little bit deeper into the details and provide some um, good support there. Okay. And if you want to share in the chat box, even if you have FOP or if you are a caregiver, um, let me know what you are, uh, your status is as you're coming to this webinar today, just so that I can get a good idea to of who our audience is, I think that would be great. So we'll start with that why, and why acknowledging that sexual health for people with FOP and just talking about it and acknowledging it will improve overall quality of life. And this is saying that acknowledging our sexual health is supporting the fact that people with disabilities are sexual beings. And in society, I, and I speak coming from the USA. So I'm coming at you live from Florida here in the USA, but I also saw in the chat box that some people are from different countries. So you might have a completely different cultural experience than maybe we do over here in the USA. But I will say that here, um, people with disabilities are not really seen as sexual beings. And I, you know, I'm an eternal optimist. So I believe that narrative is shifting, but we still have quite a way to go. Generally, people are uncomfortable talking about disability. They're uncomfortable talking about sex over here. And so then when you put the two together, it's just a lot. And so there's a level of discomfort that happens there. And so what we're wanting to do is really to expand our own zone of tolerance for talking about sex because research tells me that people with disabilities, when they are in a space where they can feel that level of discomfort coming from the other person, that it is often taken on by the person with the disability that, oh, they are uncomfortable about talking about this with me because this isn't something I should want, or is this isn't something that applies to me, or there's not a seat at this table for me to be joining in on the discussion. So there's an internalization of really shame um, and maybe even some guilt about having sexual desires or wants or needs and whatever that may be. So here in society, we are depicted often as either 
and I'm going to use extremes here, of course, and there's a lot of gray in between, but typically it's either the heroic angel who are too good to have sex or helpless, you know, maybe even victim who are unable to do anything, especially have good sex or good relationships. And because of that, there's a lot of myths that then happen. Um, and, and when I use the term sex, and I'm probably going to say this a million times, just to really make sure that if we take anything from this conversation, it's that when I use the term sex, I'm not just speaking about the heteronormative view of male, female sexual intercourse, to, to put it bluntly. So we're expanding our concept of sex today as more than just intercourse as an act and more about a sexual experience, what is intimacy, and then what do we bring to the table um, in a relationship and even that relationship with ourselves. So I'll continue to expand upon that as we talk. Um, so life satisfaction and sexual satisfaction are correlated. And there's so much literature, literature that addresses self-esteem and sexual self-esteem among men and women with disabilities. And it strongly suggests based on our report for this research, and I say our report as in like people with disabilities, that it's the contextual and social and physical and emotional dimensions of this that really, of disability, that really impact our self-esteem and our quality of life. So it's those negative attitudes or, you know, societal beliefs, cultural beliefs, lack of opportunities, um, social isolation, those things tend to be reported as the more prominent barriers to how we develop our sexual identity and how we perceive our quality of life as people with physical disabilities. So there's a very strong correlation here. And that's our big why here, right? We want to improve our overall life satisfaction. So there's a lot of shame and distress that is really around both topics, sex and disability. So we are taught here again in the USA, and I hope it's better elsewhere, but we're really taught to just, if we're not comfortable with it, we're going to pretend it's not there. And that does not bode well for us. And the whole pretending of it not being there results in lack of resources, lack of exposure, and also um, a lack of education. And that ends up leading to myths about sex and disability. So these myths that I've heard many times include, I can't have sex because I have a disability, or I can't have a relationship even because I have a disability. No one's going to want to be with me. Um, or I have a disability, so I can't also get this XYZ other disease. And that lack of sexual education is really something that we want to improve upon because unfortunately, having one diagnosis doesn't rule us out from having other things. And so with that said, um, 50% of people living with disabilities do not have, um, have not received any form of sex education. So I think it's also understandable for us to then assume that half of us here maybe have not had any form of sex education. And so talking about this might be really uncomfortable. Even just listening to this might be really uncomfortable. And that's okay. Um, 
I think really too, those of us living with a rare disease, we are, we're used to being uncomfortable. So this is just one more space that we could be uncomfortable and be resilient. in. that's how I like to look at it. So um, let's go then into more myth busting, more myths, because lack of um, this lack of information is most notably due to the belief that people with disabilities are non-sexual beings. Um, there is disabled people aren't having sex, which we know is not true. There's that disabled people are depending on others for care so they don't make great partners. That's something that is a big myth that I want to bust today because that implies that anyone who is physically able-bodied is just a great partner for a relationship where that's completely ignoring the emotional um, burden, not burden, but the emotional weight that is a very real part of a relationship um, and your ability to support someone else in what they are experiencing in their life emotionally um, is often reported to be very much so more important than the physical. And so this, again, comes from the idea here a lot, those normative beauty standards here in society, um, and really just a lack of exposure too. So we want to be paying attention to the idea that some of these ableist beliefs can also be internalized by the people who have the disability themselves. Some of these myths, some of these beliefs, maybe even beliefs that you are carrying yourself because they're deeply entrenched. Um, the last one here, women with disabilities are less affected sexually than men with disabilities because women are passive. They're in that passive sexual role. And we know that that's not true, right? Because across the board, if we are not able to have this sexual side of us as a sexual being addressed or even just like safe to be there um, without shame and without guilt, that's, that's a human reaction that we would be having, okay? So it's really something that we wanna recognize what internalized dominant, ableist, maybe even like heteronormative ideas of strength, beauty, sexuality, what continue to reside in us that could be leading to some distress that we have about this topic. And there, this is a perspective shift that we really get to talk about here. And so again, we're laying that foundation of how do we you know, I think a lot of people, maybe they see this topic of like, oh, sex and disability, I want to talk about that. But we have to start here. We have to start here. And then we also have to go into this shift in perspective that sex is between your ears and not between your legs. So it is very much so perception based. It is pleasure based. It is, it does not have to be only intercourse. And I like to really shift this one by saying, if we're just looking at sex as intercourse, it's like we're showing up to a five-star restaurant that has an enormous buffet, and we're only seeing that there's a burger, not even a cheeseburger, not even the condiments, not even anything else, the vegan options, the vegetarian options. We're not seeing any of that if we're only looking at sex as this one thing. So let's look at it for really what it is and shift into this perspective of what, what is intimacy? What do, you, what do you think that might look like for you? And then how can that be an accessible um, thing for you? So if you recall, our plan is also to not only talk about how important it is to start viewing ourselves as a sexual being, but then what do we need to do 
to get there. So we want to increase our comfort with the topic. And one way of doing that is looking at our self-esteem and our sexual self-esteem. And what is the difference here? We have to start with how we view sex between our ears, right? How do you perceive it? And our bodies is where self-esteem, desire, and sexuality all come together. And if we have those beliefs about strength, beauty, sex, and sexuality, and disability is, you know, we're looking at it as a negative thing that will negatively impact your self-esteem and your um, sexual self-esteem. It's going to create um, psychological insecurities and distress. And yes, I'm seeing in the chat box, this just reminded me of sex in the movie Demolition Man. It had nothing to do with the physical act. Right, right. So, but as humans, we play these tapes in our heads that are shaped by what we're exposed to in our culture, by our family, by our friends, by ourselves. You know, we come up with definitions too, and that directly impacts our self-esteem and our sexual self-esteem. Now, the thing too about rare disease and my experience with OI, your experience with FOP is that there are safety concerns when it comes to sex, right? And so if we're only looking at sex as this thing that could potentially really affect our safety, then, and we're looking at that as like, I don't have the capacity to then even go over there. Then we're also limiting our ability to have deep, intimate um, experience of connection with other people with sexual activity involved with or without intercourse. So we really want to be looking at that. Um, let's see. So I, and I see a question in the, um, in the box here, and I think it's applicable to right where we're at. So I'll go ahead and answer it. Um, they're saying, I can strongly state that the issues related to this topic involve many limiting beliefs reinforced by society. Absolutely. Sexuality is human, it's natural, it's normal. It just needs to be adapted to each person's needs and possibilities. Yes, we are on the same page. So um, they're asking then, what's the appropriate mindset that a person with major dis disabilities should build? So this is where we're looking at, where am I? I think we need to start with, where am I currently at? And sometimes we don't really realize where we're currently at until we sit there and put a number on it and really get clear on, on a scale, where am I at, right? So this is the perfect segue and question for, first, we're going to have this um, poll, thank you, Hope. We've got a couple of questions here. So this will give you an idea of the, your comfort level and whether or not you feel like it's where you want to be. And so you said the appropriate mindset. I mean, and that might look different for everyone, but ideally we would want to feel good about ourselves and confident about ourselves as not only just a human, but as a sexual being and that that's okay, right? And that it is like what you shared here, human and natural. So we'll start with this question. On a scale of one to 10, how comfortable are you talking about sex? And one is like, I am here, but this is super uncomfortable for me. <laughs> and then all the way up to 10, 10 is I am ready to host this webinar with you next time, Michelle. We're going to get together and talk all about sex all the time. So tell me about your level of comfort talking about sex. And then question two, on a scale from one to 10, what would you rate your self-esteem? And, and that's really just feeling your feelings about yourself overall. And then on a scale of one to 10, what would you rate your sexual self-esteem? What would you rate your sexual self-esteem? And we'll let Hope take care of that. And 
Yeah. I'll give people the results. A few more seconds. We're still trickling in. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Give everyone one more chance to submit their polling question. And go ahead and close it off now. Share our results. Great. Oh, this is good. Thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate it. So we, as far as comfortable level, it looks like we're a little on the two extremes, which is great. And something in the middle here. So majority for comfort level would be the 10, which I'm obviously a fan of, eight. So we're kind of going towards the middle. But then we go to like a two and then six, seven, and one are all tied and three. So six, seven is like high middle and then the low end, those are tied. And then we've got a majority over at 10, which I'm assuming is because you, you came here to talk about this topic. So the people that are like, yes, I'm ready. We're, we're good. You're in the right space. Then we've got on a scale of one to 10, what would you rate your self-esteem? Which it starts here. We have nothing on the lower end for one, two, and three. The majority of people are feeling like they are at an eight, which is good. Then we've got a tie with 15% for nine, seven, six, and five. And then 8% for the... Um, number four and 10, which is good. Then on a scale of one to 10, what would you rate your sexual self-esteem? So you can see here that self-esteem is doing better than sexual self-esteem. And this is typical of what we see. So when I'm working with people, they're feeling decent about themselves as a human. But then all of a sudden, when we put that extra sexual self-esteem on there, it tends to go down. So the majority here is at a seven, which is a notch below the majority for, self, for self-esteem. And then we've got 15% at a 10, at a three, at a one. So we're going all the way down now. And then 8% for two, four, five, and eight. Thank you so much for sharing. This is really great. And it's on point for themes that I'm typically seeing. So as you're looking here at this slide, so we looked at these scales. Now, what I would ask you to do then in order to get to that mindset that feels better for you is to think about what does a 10 look like? If I'm not at a 10 and I'm a five, what does a 10 even look like? And then I'm asking myself, what does the next number up from where I'm at look like? So if I'm a two, what do I need to do then to embody what a three would look like? Or is it that I need to maybe put myself out there more? Is it that I need to do a little bit more self-reflection on how I am a sexual being? Maybe at the end of this talk, it will already start to alleviate some of those beliefs and you'll already be ranking yourself differently as we continue to go through this. Um, then identifying what's a belief that's keeping you from being that number that's just one notch up, what's keeping you from being there? And then what question do you have about shifting closer to a 10? See what those blocks are. And so much of this work that I do with people is about creating that space to even ask these questions. We've got so much going on in life. We've got so much emphasis on all of the other things, even when we're having a good day, let alone when we're having a bad day. So creating space and opportunity to talk about these things for yourself to grow as a sexual being, to increase your sexual self-esteem and get you to the space of maybe having the romantic relationship that you want, or even just feeling good as someone who's single. So that's the goal. Again, quality of life, right? 
And so going back, we were originally asking that first poll question was, how do you feel about talking about sex? And I think this is kind of in particular for maybe my caregivers. And I saw that there were a couple of you in the chat box saying, oh, I have a sibling or, you know, it's, it's not just people with FOP in here. It's also people who love them. And so just as reassurance for you, as someone myself, who is the parent of two little ones with a rare disease, you don't have to be an expert in sexual health to create a safe space to discuss sexual health. You don't need to know it all, just like you don't need to know it all in mental health to support someone who's going through something. You know, you can just ask what those needs are. You can ask what those thoughts are and then just sit in that space of listening and allowing someone to maybe vocalize for the first time, probably their needs and how they feel about this topic. Okay. And that's how we then start to shift our mindset. It's through this action. It's through self-reflection. And it's also through having somebody that can hold the mirror for us as we're doing this work um, to maybe who, and someone who is skilled, I would say, in being able to say, I hear you saying this. What do you mean about that? That motivational interviewing in order to really help you sh <clears throat> shift your mindset. Okay. Um, so then that takes us to the how. And again, how do we do this? How do we, we, we just meet people where they're at. And so this is where we want to talk about reported needs. And I'm just going to talk about those um, briefly because I'm going to go into more detail with these reported needs once I gather those from all of you. Um, and then we will have more of a deep dive in part two. But first and foremost, we can talk about sex. How do we do it? We talk about sex. We talk about sex while alone, socks, sex, socks, sex with others, and then unique concerns that come up for people with physical disabilities in general. So sex while alone. This is something that, depending upon your religion as well, you may have different beliefs about masturbation being a good or a bad thing. Societal beliefs about masturbation being a wrong or a um, healthy thing. So this is where, again, you're going to have to see what fits for you. But just to bluntly talk about it and talk about self-pleasure as a way of embodying and appreciating yourself as a sexual being. Masturbation is often the first way that many people learn that they are sexual beings. And it's really the most frequently performed sex act in the world. So that's something to consider. It doesn't have to be an activity that you are doing alone. It can be done with um, a partner and it is pretty safe when we look at it because we're not looking at um, any STD, you know, problems there when we are just focusing on self-pleasure in the presence of another person. We're looking at taking control of what feels good. And this really is a way of recognizing what does feel good, what doesn't, what do I like? Having a body map that can then be shared with partners if you want to. So um, these are some myths as well. We're doing some myth busting today. So masturbation is an immature sex act is something that I've definitely heard where it's like, this is all that I'm doing. And, you know, that's something that you do in when you're first learning about your body. Not true. Most frequently performed sex act in the world. This is, this is what's the reality. You need to have an orgasm for it to be masturbation. And this is something that I work with the people that have maybe paralysis where they're not feeling orgasm in the same way that they once did prior to injury or prior to disability. Um, but you do not have to have an orgasm in order for it to be 
masturbation or self-pleasure. You don't need to be able to reach or touch things. I know that that is a concern too, is just even accessibility to your own sex organs. Um, but there are adaptive toys, there are handles, extenders, um, and a lot of things that it, da Dallas novelty that we were talking about in the beginning, I'm sure they have um, things that are available for this type of activity. So this, uh, this option is especially appealing if you have time alone, but if mobility is a concern, it may be necessary then to have conversation about positioning or getting some, <clears throat> some assistance with positioning. Pillows are going to be our friend. We wanna do positioning, which I'm going to get more into, that will alleviate pain and assist with accessibility to find pleasure. So we, again, just want to do some myth busting, and this doesn't have to be something that is done just alone. It can be done with others. And so when we introduce other people into the picture, though, then we're looking at other barriers that can come into play. And these are the typical barriers to pleasure just in general when I'm working with general population. Past negative experiences, so any type of trauma could potentially result in a um, bad experience. So negative experience brings on more negative experience. Mental health concerns could be a barrier to pleasure. Maybe you are very much so anxious or um, there's depression, there's negative self-talk happening that can be a barrier to pleasure. Because remember, sex is between the ears. So we have to check our brains. Poor communication is a big one, and then unrealistic expectations. So that, that one is really one that I work with people a lot on because there's this belief that sex has to be spontaneous. That's what we see when we see passionate sex in the movies. It is this spontaneous act where people just cannot control themselves, and that's what it's supposed to look like. But for people who need assistance with positioning or maybe they can only have pleasure or they find that setting themselves up for success involves doing it in the morning when you know they haven't taken medication yet, they had a good night's sleep. These are things that we really want to look at shifting. We want to shift all of this. Communication is the biggest one. So, and, and this is something for anyone and it's not just unique to people with disabilities. Many people actually report that communication has enhanced their, um, or their disability rather, has actually enhanced their communication because they have been put in this position of, well, I, I need to communicate. I, I need to for my own safety. And so how do we use that to our advantage? So we want to look at communicating our wants and needs with our sexual partners, communicating assistance with caretakers and attendants and communicating with healthcare professionals. Again, and keeping in mind that healthcare professionals are not always comfortable talking about sex. I've done a lot of research on that. I do a lot of presentations specifically with doctors to enhance their zone of tolerance and comfort in talking about sex because they're bringing their own discomfort to the table and it's then being internalized by their patients. So, keeping in mind that we're all working on this. Ideally, we're all working on this. So people with disabilities, because of that disability and, and needing to talk about what feels good, what doesn't, don't do this, or yes, do that, we're having to be our own advocates now in, in a way that it can actually lead to more pleasure. So I always say that people with disabilities can make the best lovers because of that. So it can be a catalyst for this change and really a growth of, well, we're used to doing things differently. How do we also do this differently and make it the best possible thing for us? So this, as my final question, before I get to your questions, I want to check in and see in the chat box, do you feel a little bit more comfortable talking about sex or even just listening 
in on the topic about sex. Is there a shift that's happening or do we need to do more work? You know, so start leaning into that and just even reflecting if you don't want to share in the chat box, think of it for yourself and see what, what do I need to do to get to that next number that I want to reach? And I'm seeing in the chat box, the importance to be able to talk about our wants and desires without feeling bad and wrong. Yes. Yes. So how do we shift into that mindset? Okay, wonderful. And so at this point, Hope, I guess we can get to the questions. Great. Um, I first want to say I've enjoyed everything you've shared so far, Dr. Vine, and it's been incredible. And I'm excited to continue this conversation. We did have some people submit questions ahead of time. So thank you so much to the people who did that. Um, and several of them are sort of around a similar theme. So the first one is how do you handle a discussion about sex when you have limited hip mobility, but still want to have intimacy with your able-bodied partner? Um, and then another one very connected to that, how do you discuss your concerns about FOP and its complications with your partner? So um, I think bringing the partner into the equation, talking about having conversations with those significant others. Mm -hmm. Right. So the first one kind of gets to, um, oh, and I see, oh, I just found the Q&A space. So um, someone said, I feel more at ease now. I do still have a mindset that I have a disability. What, will I ever have a relationship and find a partner who understands disability? You're anonymous. You are speaking to my heart because that was absolutely where my headspace was for decades of my own life. And so I can absolutely appreciate that that would be a concern across the board. And so even before we talk then about the the questions here that are saying okay how do i discuss with my partner how do i even get into the mindset of this is possible for me and that's really where we want to look at what number did we put then on that self-esteem how about sexual self-esteem where were we at what does it look like to go to the next one and what supports do i need because maybe it's simply a mindset shift of doing these talks, talking to someone about it, carving out time to even view yourself as a sexual being. Maybe it's putting yourself out there on a dating app. Maybe it's just talking to people and saying, I'm just going to connect more first. Because, And the other thing is, which this is why I believe the narrative about disability is changing, on social media, there are so many wonderful disabled people who are sharing openly their lives and their experiences with dating. Um, I myself met a dear friend on the app called Clubhouse, and um, he is he has CP, and the two of us have done a number of conversations all about sexual self-esteem and disability, and just being able to deeply believe that we can have what we want, because you won't have it until you do. And until you believe it's possible, we will sabotage ourselves by either not putting ourselves out there or just believing what other people tell us about ourselves. So that's where we need to start that shift. Going back now into the positioning, say you've got a partner and you're wanting to do these things. It's that saying that I said I was going to say a million times where sex is not just intercourse. So we have to look at the safety concerns. Each one of you need to evaluate that for yourself. But from what I understand for FOP, there's a lot of um, concern about anyone really extending you. So it's got to be yourself that you're doing what your body is allowing for you. But then how do we incorporate just pleasure in general? Um, the positioning that we can talk about in part two, I've done a lot of work with even just older people who have maybe had hip replacement or people who have spasticity or low range of motion. And we don't want to be on our backs then as the person with our hips laid out 
with gravity working against us and pressure. We just don't want that. So how do we adapt moving to a side position? How do we put pillows? How do we really make things more accessible in that way? Um, and I know that then we went into how do I talk to my partner just about FOP? And I think as humans, we get stuck on the how, the I don't know how, right? But it really is a I'm afraid. So if we just identify the feeling there of it brings up fear because maybe I'm afraid that if I talk, about this, they're no longer going to be interested or what that was a fear for me that I, so I would just not talk about it again, just pretend that it's not there, but it's very rare, you know, it's really there. It's there. And so then there would be a self-sabotage of, I didn't want to talk about it. And so things would fizzle because I was not being myself. I was not being open and honest about what was really going on with me. Eventually this person needed to know that information, right? So we have to really get to the fear. What is holding us back from sharing what's going on um, in our life? Um, let's see. I met my able-bodied significant other over a dating app is shared in the chat box. I too met my significant other over a dating app. And that was before it was like a thing to be doing. Um, and yes, uh, in the chat box. Thank you for the dissertation. Absolutely. I'm very passionate about that. Um, let's see, did I fully answer the questions? One came in in the Q&A, Michelle, and I typed an answer and it moved it over, but there were two parts. The first okay. part, um, question one is how do we eliminate the fear of discussing our wants and needs without feeling or being seen as awkward? No, I get it we feel really awkward. Um, and I think this is even more significant in the rare disease space because there's this level of like, um, yeah, so I'm one in a, a million or whatever your stat is. And so there's that awkward feeling, that loneliness feeling that Nobody gets me feeling that I don't want to be different, but I'm extremely different when it's rare or ultra rare, right? And so the question was, how do I um, eliminate the fear? And I think sometimes we have to recognize that the fear is going to be there. How do we instead let the fear be there and do it anyway? Because I can tell you, even with public speaking, there is, I still always feel a little bit nervous when I'm about to do something. But if I told myself, you're feeling that way, so it's not time, then I never would have spoke. So it's all about feeling the fear, reminding yourself that this, this is going to be an awkward conversation. I'm going to embrace it for what it is. And the more comfortable you become in having that conversation and that process is, is difficult. You can work with a coach, you can talk it out with other people, you could write it down, but at some point you will have to feel the fear and do it anyway. And you can do it and be surround yourself with people that tell you that you can do it and that it's worth doing. So we are coming up on time and I, Michelle, we did have um, one more question that came in through the Q&A ahead of time. Um, that was about changing the perspective of the opposite sex about FOP. So mm -hmm. I think we might've answered this a little bit in, um, you know, talking to your partner, um, but I guess, is there anything else that you would add to that maybe specific to the FOP part of um, the equation as opposed to the sex. Yeah. So changing the perspective of the partner about FOP. And so, and without the person here to kind of get clarity, what that may kind of feel like it's coming from a space of, I need to 
change their mind about my limitations, or I really need to sell them on FOP not being terrible so that they want to be in this relationship with me, or maybe they're already in a relationship and the partner is very concerned about FOP. And and we'll put it with the topic of sexuality just because um, I can understand why someone might be concerned having not lived with it and just hearing things on paper about limitations. Um, I would really just focus on encouraging anyone to, to listen to you um, and to follow your lead, to also know that the more comfortable you are with yourself and the more that we're able to increase our own self-esteem and sexual self-esteem, other people will feel that. And then you'll meet people who are drawn to that as opposed to the fear being projected and them feeling it because we feel each other's energy. If someone is uncomfortable with something, you can feel that. And so how do we take care of ourselves and our own comfort level with FOP, Mm -hmm. self-esteem wise, our comfort level with FOP and being a sexual being? So sexual self-esteem, how do we start working on that? Because we can't change other people. I always want to make that plug too. We can work on ourselves, which then could like be a byproduct is somebody else shifting, but we can really only work on ourselves and our comfort level. Thank you. I think this has been such an incredible start, as we said, to this discussion, which we want to bring um, to the next level in part two. So um, for all of our attendees still on the line, thank you so much for joining today and staying with us. I did want to say that part two is going to be a Zoom meeting. So, you know, you would all be on video. The goal of that is to have discussion between participants, um, between Michelle and participants and between one another for all of you. And so in order to do that in a way that is most um, comfortable or supportive for people, we're looking at doing two different sessions. Um, And in order to plan how those sessions are broken up, Um, I'm going to be doing a survey with people, so please keep an eye out to see if you are interested in participating in part two to complete that survey. Um, Another thing that if you can stay on the line for one more minute and complete the um, survey at the end of today's webinar, if you are interested in being involved in the planning of that meeting, please do... um, note that in your survey so that I can follow up and reach back out to you to continue this discussion Um, because we want to incorporate the FOP perspective into that next meeting. So um, I would just love if you're interested in being a part of that planning for you to let me know. I see in the chat box that someone is saying they've got numerous websites and articles on adaptive sex and equipment. Um, And yes, the, the list would be, I think, fantastic for people to have. Um, Also, if you have any questions or anything else that you wanna share with me, or if you you just want to share more on the topic of sex and FOP, I've got my contact information there, my social media is there, and I would love, love, love to continue to connect with all of you.